Queer Relation Tips, an IM clinic podcast devoted to helping you, the LGBTQ plus community, create the love lives and relationships you crave. Welcome to Queer Relation Tips. Some of the episodes in our lineup are what we call a Relation Tips Q&A, a safe space for everyday folks to talk with a therapist about a problem or topic with the hope that others can relate and gain insight into their own journeys. And somehow I, I uh, <laughs> the search for the one mm-hmm. um, didn't work on me either. So I've had wonderful partners and one husband along the way. Mm-hmm. And um, each one has been amazing and given gifts to me and my journey, but still the tendency is to look at yourself as somehow damaged because I couldn't keep one for 30 years. And so, you know, of course, what's wrong with me? Y'all know that life can be rough. Grief and death, marriage and divorce, relationships, love, belonging, and breakups. Life throws us so many hurdles to jump over and challenges to crawl through. Jamie, one of I Am Clinic's associates, sits with our guest who approaches life with such humor, ease, and joy that makes life seem a little bit more easy. Something not to be taken with such deep seriousness. They bring a lifespan of insight and challenges I hope that you enjoy listening to and learning from. He's someone who has brought so much of his vulnerability to us today. You know, I'm so thankful that we have queer siblings who have gone before us to literally pave the way for our version of love, our version of sex, our social equality, and our civil rights. It is with deep gratitude that we sat with our guest because he is one who fought so hard for what we so easily access. Let's take a listen. Well, let's just kind of dive in. Like, um if there was kind of a pain point in life that you kind of wanted maybe to process with a therapist, where would you go? Um, Yeah. And this is non COVID related. I I mean, of course it's in the middle of that, but you know, we, I've lived, I lived a long time and COVID is just one of those things. Um, You know, for me, there is definitely some PTSD in that, when I first started conducting LGBTQ choruses, uh, I walked into a gay men's chorus in 1987 to be their artistic director and had no idea what, what the people in there with sores and somebody with, a, with a, an oxygen tank. And I'm like, what, what have I walked into? And of course I walked into a full blown pandemic that for the next years would occupy our whole lives. And then, um, and I'm also HIV positive. So, um, you know, the years following that, things got so much better. And now I am still conducting LGBTQ choruses and entering the second pandemic. And really the PTSD comes with all of the things that now we've experienced twice. And that is fear, fear of touching someone else, fear of how do you contract this disease? Um, and, you know, uh, here we are all those years later, 30, 35 years later with no vaccine mm-hmm. for, for AIDS. And so um, it's a little, it's a little disgusting and heartbreaking to watch the entire world rally around a vaccine for COVID yeah. when we couldn't, we couldn't get anybody's attention um, back mm-hmm. in those days. So uh, this, this time is um, it, it brings us back to two things. One, it brings us back, it brings the loss back mm-hmm. in full color, full technicolor, the loss of, of those that we loved so much. And, um, you know, they were right here. And it's interesting that pretty much everybody in those days, by the time it got full blown, everybody knew somebody who was affected by AIDS directly. Um, I think one of the problems with COVID is we're so many degrees of separation apart from that reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, don't, we don't know. I mean, and, and with AIDS, it was very visible. Yeah. You knew when someone had AIDS. And uh, boy, this one is quite different. Mm-hmm. But these kinds of things, um, the loss is, is uh, on, on my head all the time. The loss mm-hmm. Of, mm-hmm. of not just people during this time, but the loss of the way of life 
And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've said many times, um, trying to be a leader, <laughs> trying to be inspiring and, and written articles about the fact that it's taken away what we do, mm -hmm. but it can't take away who we are. And at the end of the day, uh, I'm a, an activist and uh, I'm a musician and an activist. And right now the music making has been taken away. Um, but I still get to be an activist and, and, um, you know, hopefully a, a good guy. So you asked, that was a really long answer. Uh -huh. to, is there an inflection point, a particular inflection point of pain uh, at this moment for which I would seek a therapist? And yes, I'm in the middle of, um, of a breakup of relationship and mm -hmm. uh, boy, oh boy, uh, those are all consuming. So yeah, I've, I've had, uh, uh, yeah, always, always the relationship uh, therapy is uh, top of mind for me throughout my life. And um, I've had wonderful partners. I had, uh, I was married to a woman for 13 years and had um, two beautiful children. And I'm so lucky to, to be a granddad and have had uh, those, you know, those are interesting relationships that you can pretty much count on. But you know, when you have adult uh, children, it's uh, those relationships are amazing, and um, and I've had difficult relationship with my son when I came out. That was uh, quite something. But um, and then uh, I'll just jump in to the greatest loss of my life with a lot of losses. Um, my daughter died a year and a half ago suddenly, and um, it's the greatest loss will be the greatest loss of my life. There is none other that could ever um, affect me more deeply than that. So the year and a half um, has been one of uh, regrouping emotionally and how do you go on with that? And um, I entered into a relationship about a, about a week after she died um, mm. and as a, not as a life preserver, at all. I mean, it wasn't like somebody threw me a rope, but um, it was very sweet. And that's the relationship that's now ending and, and not ending on an hourly basis. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. So, so that was a long one, but so the inflection point of pain and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, loss is uh, a, a broad one. Absolutely. And, um, and I, I know you all don't mind if I mention that I just released my memoir and, um, and the whole thing is about um, loss and getting up and mm. uh, and brushing off and moving on and letting it letting it catapult me into something better. So uh, you know, mm -hmm. I got to go back and and look at my sixty nine years and go, okay, this loss it's going to catapult me to something better, <laughs> and just hang on to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How have you coped with that grief? Well, the um, of course, I was working and uh, it was conducting the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. And mm -hmm. uh, immediately within eight days of her death, uh, I conducted them in our 40th anniversary, which was a requiem based mm -hmm. on the stages of grief eight days later. Wow. So, but I had no choice. I mean, and, and besides, you know, you always say, well, she would have wanted you to do that. And you make that, that's a statement that people make up. But in this case, of course she would. And yeah. so I did, and I kept going because it was in the holiday season and we were busy. And in the spring, um, I found myself falling apart, uh, mm -hmm. not outwardly so much to people, but I was uh, having memory loss from the mm -hmm. trauma. And yeah. my father died and my brother had died before that. So it was just bang, bang, bang. Mm -hmm. And um, so the memory loss was, uh, short-term memory was like, I don't know. So I took a sabbatical and that's what happened. And I just took some time off and went out to the, to the coast north of here and, and wrote. And mm -hmm. the, the, um, I, the, I literally wrote my memoir, although I wasn't planning on a memoir because that sounds so like pissy and like, oh, I'm just going to go write my memoir <laughs> and, uh, with clenched teeth. I'm like, oh, geez, that's not what it was about. It really was about organizing my life 
um, and see and putting it all out there on paper and it, and then it turned into chapters and then Ooh. someone said we'll publish it and I'm like no <laughs> so um, and now it is and it's very vulnerable yeah I, I feel, yeah there's a whole chapter on um, husbands boyfriends uh, boyfriends lovers and a husband and mm. yeah because um, relationships uh, uh, it's funny because uh, when you grow up, which I did as Southern Baptist uh, and for 35 years, you know, you're told that your, your search is for two things, God's will in your life mm. and the one, mm. the perfect one that God has ordained for you. And it's just this search, it's this frantic search because, yeah. oh my gosh, there's a perfect will and there's a perfect one. Mm. And then you search and then, you know, the, the perfect one, which was what the world had told me I was supposed to have, which was a cisgendered female, mm. uh, didn't work out so well for me after 13 years. And, um, and then you go, well, oh, well, maybe there isn't one. And maybe there's really no such thing as God's will. Mm. And um, then you wake up and you realize, number one, that whatever you're doing today is the will, your will combined with the will of the universe. This is what I'm doing. That today is what I'm supposed to do, be doing. Mm -hmm. And it will flow and it will ebb and flow. So that part of like searching for God's will, that went yeah. away. And that was good. And somehow I, I uh, <laughs> the search for the one mm -hmm. um, didn't work on me either. So I've had wonderful partners and one husband along the way. Mm -hmm. And um, each one has, has been amazing and given gifts to me and my journey. But still the tendency is to look at yourself as somehow damaged um, because I couldn't keep one for 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, of course, what's wrong with me in that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Why, why didn't I do that? But, you know, I, I go back to American Idol and Simon Cowell, who's always like, it's all about song selection. It's all about song selection. You choose the right song and you're going to make it. Mm -hmm. well, it's, about, it's about men selection. And, <laughs> all in the it's all in the men selection and while i always chose really good people uh -huh. they obviously weren't the one for the long haul or i wasn't prepared mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and what category does the the person that you're in a breakup with right now fall into is that young uh, young okay <laughs> <laughs> really young that yeah. was a surprise um Oh man, uh, he came along at the right time and mm. is an unbelievably uh, sweet, sensitive, amazing, beautiful, beautiful man, beautiful soul. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're just not going to be a good fit for the long term. And part of that, interestingly enough, is, um, and this you will love, um, we feed each other's insecurities. Mm -hmm. And um, he also grew up uh, under the thumb of Independent Baptist, which is okay. even worse than Southern Baptist. I mean, his entire life before coming out. And, uh, you know, when you are indoctrinated slash brainwashed um, by organized religion, coming out of that, and I'm sure both of you have worked with many people struggling with trying to overcome mm -hmm. the, the indoctrination that you have. Um, there's an insecurity and then you come out and uh, for me, I came out of a church with 22,000 members where I was the leader and um, all that goes away and I lost everything. So did he, uh, your underpinnings, you have to start building those up again for yourself. And um, I have had, I've had longer building time mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and he hasn't, and the insecurity comes from always um, learning to trust, especially when you're a leader. Um, you learn through your life that um, there are very few people that you can or should trust with a hundred percent of your heart and your and your soul, and those you have to choose very wisely. Mm -hmm. And how has that kind of come into your personal romantic relationships, that piece of um, not feeling like you can trust people 100%? Yeah, 
Yeah, my, uh, well, it comes, of course, in, uh, in our age, and I don't know where all your listeners are, but um, out where I live, you know, with the, the fruits and nuts and the granola people and uh, mm -hmm. the sexual revolution came early, started here, um, mm -hmm. open relationships are what we do. Uh, I would count on five fingers. Uh, the number of people that I that are in monogamous relationships, okay. and especially in the gay world, and especially I think um, gay men, and um, it's I'm very comfortable with an open relationship. It just takes a lot of communication, obviously, and mm -hmm. a lot of trust, okay. and that trust can be broken really easily. You build mm -hmm. it up um, gently and one little piece at a time, and right. um, over over time. And then, you know, it's like Jenga, or we used to have pickup sticks. You pull one out and or the wrong one, and the whole thing falls down, and then you're back to square one. So mm -hmm. I'm in a, um, I have a lot, of, we, have, we have a lot of conversations about emotional monogamy and physical monogamy, mm -hmm. and how mature people <laughs> mm -hmm. can separate those two. And um, I want emotional monogamy in my partner. I want to be the only one that he loves and is in love with and and the physical monogamy that's totally negotiable for me mm -hmm. but um yeah and um my my current boyfriend or soon to not be uh, really wants uh, to not have emotional monogamy he, he wants mm -hmm. his experience and it's part of that is obviously youth so it's really not the physical but it's the emotional and he he wants um multiple relationships hmm. that are feeding him and that he can be in love with or be lovers with multiple people and you know that brings us to polyamory which um well actually what he wants is not polyamory um hmm. and i had mentioned to you all before that um he and i and another man were in a throuple Mm -hmm. and um, the amazing things we learned yeah. from being in a throuple, which, uh, first of all, it's hard. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, but it's also really, really wonderful to have uh, be in a relationship with two people who love each other and love you. So that it was, um, it was a positive. It was a net positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was curious kind of what's led you to the place where you want emotional monogamy and what does that actually kind of mean to you? I don't, I, it's, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I, it may be, it may, since you asked that, I hadn't even thought about it, but it may be left over. I mean, mm -hmm. that could be left over from, from the days of indoctrination that, that there's one. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah. I think may, maybe it's because of my age that I I want one. And certainly part of that is my age says, for the rest of my days, I really want one. Yeah. And I deserve one. And, um, you know, if I were young, if I were in my mid-30s, I'd go, I can have all the candy in the candy store and, <laughs> um, and be in love with every piece of candy. Um, but yeah, for me, my, um, I want to, I'm ready to settle in mm. and I'm let, I want to settle in with someone who values, um, me yeah. and values the relationship enough that it's first. Mm. You're craving kind of being the priority and having a sense of bondedness and security. And yes. uh, are not interested in, you're wanting yeah. to build, right? Not build and rebuild. That's correct. Kind of but yeah, I, I mentioned to you all the fact that, of course, I, I'm a workaholic and type A, and I know that's just words, but I have worked so hard, worked, work, 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 work. And that's absolutely part of why some of the relationships waned is because mm -hmm. I would work so hard and be so busy that I didn't have time to, mm -hmm. to or didn't take the time. I had the time, but I didn't mm -hmm. take the time. And now as I go into this phase, I have the time. And, um, you know, I want somebody that uh, values the time. Mm -hmm. And what have you kind of done? Because I, I know that you had mentioned before that you can't help but feeling like 
what's wrong with me is that oh my goodness yes this self-talk? yeah this oh boy that's self-talk isn't it yeah. um yeah especially in a situation where um the other person is wants to wants to keep me but also wants to have a lot of other uh, mm-hmm. relationships not mm-hmm. just sex but relationships so the the real danger is um i'm not enough mm. i'm not enough or he wouldn't need to find love not mm-hmm. sex but love in so many other places and um yeah he says you're enough but <laughs> and so um stepping back from that is really hard because um in my head and on paper i'm enough mm-hmm. yeah. oh, oh what a catch you know i mean geez um but it's not working out in my heart or i wouldn't give it away this way mm-hmm. 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 you wouldn't give away your kind of emotion. If, if my if my the, if what my brain is telling me that uh-huh. you're enough yes then i would say then i would protect my heart and not give it to okay. someone who treats yes. it that way and mm-hmm. who treats it as if um that's lovely but that i need five at a time mm-hmm. and um yeah i can't be i can't be one fifth right yeah and that's where kind of when you talked about you put the fact that you play off of each other's insecurities comes in correct too. yeah um, and it's challenging because at this point you're wanting that so, and you're craving that so much, but um, that person isn't in your life at the moment that you're wanting right. to deal with. So is that sort of an inward battle right now? Of like it is. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, it, this is not a. Right? This is not a surprise. This it didn't all of a sudden. Yeah. He didn't all of a sudden say, uh, yeah. "I like you, but I want you to be one of five. It's been that in a in discussion the entire time this is this is who i am and what i think i need and he has said all along this is who i am and what i think i need however uh, i love you so much i can give that up for a little while and then he can't and then mm-hmm. he can and then he can't and um i uh, am guilty of yeah it's this is two sided it's always, always going to be two-sided. Yeah. And I'm guilty of my own insecurities that would say to him, um, you need to go experience these things. You're young. You need to go. I, I, mm-hmm. I sense that you need to go. And that was my really poor way of trying to get him to say, oh, no, I don't. You're enough. Yeah. And so when I would push him away and go, maybe you need to go experience all this. And then he would say, yeah, you're right. And mm-hmm. I would say, but wait, I, wait that, that's not what I would know. <laughs> right, exactly. That's not, that's what not the way that it, it your person wanted to hear. Or I wanted to double hear. speak, passive aggressive bullshit. Um, that's not what I wanted out of that. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're now at the point of uh, how do you stop this thing? Because we are we're in love with each other, no question about it. Right. Um, but how do you stop and take a breath? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, oh boy, going backwards uh, to another level of relationship yeah. is incredibly difficult. Absolutely, yeah. I, I know it's. I know I'm addicted to him. I get it. I mm-hmm. have. I've, I've lived in and around um, addiction and recovery my whole life, and um, I understand that you have to give it up. It's very hard, um, you know, an alcoholic that gives up alcohol, but maybe I can just have a little alcohol, maybe. <laughs> is, is a li- can I just have a little of my boyfriend? Um, I understand that's not really working, but I, I have not found the courage to make that step. And maybe it's today. Hey there. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. I just wanted to take a quick break to introduce myself. My name is Jamie Leach, and I'm so glad I can help co-host Queer Relationships. I grew up here in Denver and love my work at I Am Clinic. Isaac, the founder of I Am Clinic, and I went to graduate school together. Years later, we decided it was time to team up at I Am Clinic and further propel our passion of serving our community with our professional skills and resources. 
At the clinic, I work with individuals and specialize in working with couples and other relationship structures. I believe that intentionality, self-awareness, connectedness, and compassion are core attributes of functional relationships. My methods pull from different theories, interventions, research findings, and life experiences, and my goal is to utilize these to collaborate with my clients and tailor our sessions to what will be most helpful to their unique situation. It is an honor to work with my clients. We have the most wonderful clients, and it is my joy to help them understand how to relate to themselves and others in more fulfilling ways. To find out more about me and I Am Clinic, visit IamClinic.org. That's IamClinic.org. Now, let's get back to the show. What's um, what's holding you back, the, mo- the number one thing? Because it sounds like you have come to a place where you really identified, right? That you want to have a relationship that at least is emotionally monogamous. Sounds like you're open yep. to it, actually open. Um, but I, I, I can tell you um, what what's holding me back is fear of being alone. Mm-hmm. When you've been this close for almost, almost two years, um, and then all of a sudden you go, okay, now yeah. that part goes mm-hmm. away. And it's been, uh, we share a lot of, uh, a lot of, interesting things such as uh, profession and things like that. Um, and we, we share a lot. I mean, like, yeah, 80% of the things that we, who we are and what we do mesh. So mm-hmm. there's the fear of that, of that loss. And of course, there's always the fear that I will never find someone else and, sure. and I won't, and I can't do better. So why don't I just do that? And then mm-hmm. there's also the daddy part of me that, um, wants to help uh, this beautiful young man and help teach him some of the things I've learned mm. and keep him from some of the pitfalls that I went through. Yeah. None of that is valid. <laughs> I, get <laughs> I mean, I get that. Uh, well, it's, it's just a natural too- craving right now, right? Like life stage wise, you're in a developmental place where you're looking at generativity versus stagnation, right? That's yeah. what. Absolutely. Oh, oh yeah. So that also yeah. comes into place where you're wanting to, in a lot of ways, preserve him from the pains that you experienced and his own bond. Yeah. So you're kind of in a state of ambivalence, it sounds like actually, right? Where you know, and there's a, there's some pretty hard lines in there, like what you're not going to do, but you don't exactly know what you want to do. Um, And especially within this relationship, because you are wanting to move away, but you're still wanting to stay. So your mind isn't actually totally made up yet. Oh my goodness, no. No, we agree that we're going to take a week of space and within six hours, one or the other of us has texted the other one. So mm-hmm. I'm sure that everyone's out there going, yes, I've been in that situation before, or, or maybe not. And if you haven't, good for you. Um, you know, you just find yourself here um, mm-hmm. knowing what to do, you knowing what, what's best for you to do. But this heart tug yeah. is uh, really, really strong. Mm-hmm. And does that kind of push pull that you both are in? Does that sort of feed, in some ways, that addictive cycle for you? Like, oh, um, oh my goodness, like, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, you're looking for that next text, and there's sort of this part of you that's craving um, to hear that you matter, right? And that tells you you matter. Yeah, even just a, an innocuous text, you know, the ding, I <sighs> grab my phone. Hope, yeah. hoping it's from him and uh, and I'm sure he does the same thing mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. yeah there's no question that uh, there's addiction in here and mm-hmm. I, I have not had an addictive personality throughout my career other than mm-hmm. work sure. I've always been addicted to work um, but I've not I've not had to deal with other addictions except mm-hmm. boy oh boy this one yeah yeah. And the other question I have is, have you been that vulnerable with him in terms of sharing all this? Have you yes. been able to share what this is like for you? Oh, every day. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, constantly. And um, yeah, we and we are at an impasse of what we want uh-huh. for, for our future. We are at a complete uh-huh. impasse. Um, you know, I keep saying, I mean, hi, I'm an older gentleman and like, give me five years, just give me five years of your life. You'll have plenty of time to do whatever you want um, after that. And uh, that's a really shitty bargain. So <laughs> that's, no, yeah, that, yeah, no, 
Um, the belonging there, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, our um, future lifespan is obviously completely different. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, uh, when I was his age, I was just coming out, 35, and had two children and child support. And, you know, I, I just had, it was a different time for me. I was not free. And, um, and you know, th there's a lot of me that says, go, be free, do the things at 35 I didn't get to do. Um, because I had so many responsibilities uh, in those days. Oh. And, um, so yeah, there's a lot of, I, I want him to experience it mm -hmm. for himself. Because, uh, you know, there's, there's that thing of, well, if, you, if he comes back to me and, and gives up what he really wants, which is okay. um, emotional polygamy, I guess you'd call it, um, then he resents me for having given it up. Mm. And I want to avoid that at all costs. Sure, sure. Yeah. And what do you feel like if, if he were to change his mind, right? And he was like, I do want to be emotionally monogamous. What does that ultimately give you? What does that satisfy for you that you feel like is missing right now? That's a, a, a great question. Um, uh, at this point, I, I think maybe everybody wants this, but no, I think there are some people that, that hmm. don't want, um, that re truly want to be single. Um, but mm -hmm. for me, I, I have loved in my life, living my life in relation with one other person. Mm -hmm. I have loved that. I've always lived, um, not for someone else, but as a couple, I, I love mm -hmm. being a couple. I love, uh, working together, discovering each other, doing mm -hmm. things, all those things. So I like living my life in relation to one other person. Okay. It, it could be two other people, but, um, but in a small, no more than three total. Uh, oh. uh, beyond that, it's way too busy. <laughs> uh, um, I think it would give me this, what I've been looking for, especially in this part of just mm. settling. Mm -hmm. I'm not settling for someone, but yeah. settling, settling in. I just want to settle. Yeah. I'm looking for, yeah, that emotional attachment. Sure, you want security. And and then there's kind of a push-pull that's an interesting thing, and I find this a lot um, in terms of a, it's almost like conflicting ideologies, right? So there's this um, idea of valuing, right, the individuals within the relationship, like, so much that we don't want to, like, influence too much or impose ourselves right. um, in a relationship upon that, you know, individual, we want to be a person who like encourages and flourishes their individuality and we want them to do the same. Yeah. But then what kind of happens is like, it's almost like a Venn diagram, right? There's like two individuals that are hanging out. Mm -hmm. And in order for there to be that overlapping part, there has to be a way in which you're willing to be influenced and also influence, right? Meaning that um, in some ways, right, it actually can be okay to say, um, you know, this is what I am hoping for, and I don't think I'm taking from you if you were to, if you were to like, be influenced in that way, right? Yeah, um, but that's the push-pull I hear a little bit, where you're like, I don't want to take anything away from him, but I want to be chosen still, right? I do, I, I, and um, I look I look at I look at me. I, I get what this adds to me, uh, for sure. But yeah. I also look at him, and um, he, even though he's young and has been out uh, twelve or thirteen years, mm -hmm. um, has also not found that settling, um, yeah. that person to settle in with and learn from and do all the the unwrapping that you do in a relationship and so i want that for him as well uh, i want it for me and i want it for him yeah, yeah. as you yeah um, there's also uh, because because uh, i live out here and it actually happens more than than you think there's a daddy boy uh part of this and it adds it adds another layer that a lot of people are not willing to discuss because you know there are there are daddy boy relationships with people who are the same age. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Chronological age isn't really a part of that. <laughs> it, um, it, it does confuse things because um, yeah. 
you know, you're my daddy and I want, uh, do I have your consent to, to go on a trip? And, um, and, and he really doesn't want my consent. Uh, and so it's, uh, I'm like, well, first of all, you don't need my consent. And second of all, th uh, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So, so you're not wanting that authority over his life. I don't. I don't. No. You want so there there to be a sense where you both are, you know, equals on um, yeah. an emotional plane. Yes. Um, but that's really risky, right? If the two of you, it actually in some ways would require greater vulnerability from both of you. Um, yeah. Actually, you know, be like, oh, we're going to um, trust one another and kind of sink into that settling in. And, um, and, you know, it's, it just makes me wonder like what that would look like, right? If, um, if you were to allow that, right, to happen um, in your relationship with him. I know that he said that he's not interested in emotional monogamy, mm -hmm. but um, the way in which he is choosing you, right? Um, how does that, how does that in your inner person kind of not feel like enough right now? Yeah, uh, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I don't want to be one of five people that he's in love with and carrying on a love relationship with. And um, that is not okay with me. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I know that. And I, I, I feel like it deletes the affection for you or what, what is that like for you specifically? I guess, because that's going to be different for everyone. The reason I, I can't share him with five people at one time, emotionally, yeah, with whom I'm not in a relationship, and so it's yeah. not it's not a group. Um, yeah. yeah, I I just don't think anyone has the the ability, the wherewithal, or the capability mm. to love and invest mm -hmm. and be a part of five different people in five different cities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exhausting. I mean, there's at some point that will uh, wear him completely out emotionally and it will wear me out watching it and sharing it um, and um, because you know I've I've seen it um, yeah. I've seen it uh, because when you're trying to be in a relationship with someone you're there and and texting that person and calling them and thinking of of what you can do next to make them happier and mm -hmm. then oh wait 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 and then wait 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 and there are five of those sure. and, um, he thinks he can do it and I don't want to be I don't want to be around to watch sure that's fair yeah that makes total sense it sounds like for you it would really diminish kind of the quality of the relationship and the um yeah. the thing that you're ultimately seeking right yeah I don't want to go from full-on boyfriends to friends with benefits sure sure yeah. Yeah. yeah right right that's right um so as you're thinking about what it is that you do want, right? And all the things that you've learned from these relationships in your life, what is that dream? What is I do that? have, uh, I've written it down. I, I, I have the dream, the dream man. Um, I, he doesn't have a face yet, uh -huh. but, um, but the face certainly has facial hair. Just want you to know that. It's <laughs> 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 unknown face, um, but it has to have facial hair. <laughs> I love me. This is sorry, sorry, smooth guys. Um, the smooth guys, yeah, I love you, but don't want to be with you. Um, yeah, I there's I, I can't say that my emotional quotient is the highest in the world, um, obviously, but um, I want someone that is near my level of emotional quotient, and I want somebody who is um, settled within themselves. And that I and that wants the same thing that I want. That's mm -hmm. pretty clear. Kind of the bottom yeah. line. Uh, I know what I want, and I would love to find someone who shares most of that, or um, at the very least, the core things. Obviously, we're not going to like all the same food or the same uh, activities. I mean, but the core. I need that person to. Mm -hmm. Kind of like your roots, your roots match. Is yeah, that just and um, okay. yeah, I, I think it's going to have to be someone. Also, I just think it's going to have to be someone older than mid thirties for me. The yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. that I love intergenerational relationships. I think they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, 
trying one for the first time that was 35 years apart was uh, a, a gamble. Sure. So I think they're going to have to be a little older. They There are all kinds of other things in my ideal person. Um, oh. And one of them is humor, this just period. Yeah. Sure. If someone's okay. humorless, they're not going to get along with me. Because <laughs> the if you don't laugh at my jokes, you're out. Sure. <laughs> it can't be the ha, ha, ha. No, it's got to be a belly laugh. And um, so there's that. And, um, and romantic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody that's romantic and and spend some time on me and yeah. That makes sense. You're kind of really wanting to find um, that uh, the whole picture, right? Where we we talk about kind of a triangle in a relationship where you have commitment, um, intimacy, and passion, right? And I think it sounds like you're really hoping for those to exist. And Doesn't everyone want all three of those? Yes, yeah, it's with the balance. And, and yet we find ourselves kind of sometimes in relationships that have two out of three or one out of three or, or whatnot. And um, it sounds like you've already been in that process of really trying to figure out, do I believe I can have three out of three? Yeah, I, I'm i young enough to want all three. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a wonderful thing to want. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really appreciate you you sharing all of this, right? And I know that um, we certainly wasn't, weren't going to get to all of the answers <laughs> within one session, but it sounds like over over many years of, of kind of learning about yourself and, you know, processing these different relationships that have kind of influenced you that you have really loved, right? Um, that you're actually in a place where you're really ready to sort of receive that, um, all three, that you've done that work of, even if it's still a battle, that head in the heart alignment of this is what I really want and I'm, I'm ready to receive it. Yeah, I, I love good? your, yeah, I love your triangle and the decision of um, if you can't have all three, which one would you leave on the de on the desert island? Which, which two would you want to take with you? That's uh -huh. an amazing uh, imponderable. Or maybe yeah. pleasurable, but yeah. um, or or the triangle. Can it just be smaller? Mm -hmm. <laughs> can I have to have each of those things in their fullness? Can That's I have right. one that maybe is a little diminished because the other two are so great? Yeah. Um, and at this point, I'm not. With, at this point, I want the whole triangle. Good. That's good. You know? yeah. yeah. You're wanting that. You're wanting that security and. Yeah. Um, action and balance and it's a it's a really great posture to be taking in the stage and I so appreciate um, everything that you shared today do you have like any questions or sort of last thoughts? No, I, I, I think the only thing I would say um, life is life is grand yeah the, the goods are great the, the the bads are are fine and they all as they say in that trite to uh, add to the fabric um, each of those adds to make this beautiful fabric. And I've always jumped in with both feet and we'll do that the next, the next time around. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, never a victim, never ever have been a victim, uh, not allowed myself to do that through a lot of loss and confusion in my own personal relationships. I found Tim to be really sincere and honest, and he brought up a lot of really important topics mm -hmm. um, that I feel like affect the LGBTQ community. And it was really fun to have someone um, who's lived a lot of life because we often don't have people who show us the way as mm -hmm. queer people in the community. You know, sadly, we lost a whole generation. Mm -hmm. Um, to the AIDS epidemic and mm -hmm. it's kind of a treat to be able to hear from someone who's kind of not only lived through that um, who can teach us about grief and loss but someone who's lived a lot of relationships in a time when it took a lot more courage mm -hmm. to be out and open um, yeah so maybe what was one of the themes that really stood out for you that Tim yeah. brought yeah absolutely yeah, I think um, I was just so appreciative of everything that Tim did share because um, he did approach this time with such a, a level of openness um, and candor that I just um, really admired. 
and of course made me wish that we had even more time uh, together to kind of dive into some of those things more fully. Um, I think Tim is definitely in a time of reflection and I think that came across um, very clearly with just the season that he's at in his life, um, life stage and development. And then also, of course, um, the connecting and unifying, you know, tragedy of the pandemic that we're all going through. I think that's like really um, prompted a lot of us um, in the queer community and, and in the broader world to like really be thinking through things more fully. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the themes that really kind of stuck out to me um, that kind of tied through the topics that were brought up is as Tim was reflecting, I think there was a lot of um, intergenerational topics that came up around mm -hmm. how he has experienced the process of coming out. Um, mm -hmm. Even being, even growing up Baptist, right? Like that was a huge um, difference for him. And how has he, how has he brought those experiences of his youth into his adulthood? And then as he's also processing through um, navigating or renegotiating the current relationship that's he, that he's in, it's up front and center um, on a regular basis, this kind of different generational experience of being in the queer community. Did you um, notice that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I think it's really interesting as a clinician to observe different generations of queer people and to hear what they're struggling with, but also to hear a lot of um, the challenges influencing their identity and their identity mm -hmm. development. And it's, um, again, I always am just so humbled and respectful of those who've gone before us because I honestly don't know if I would have had the courage to be authentic mm -hmm. in a climate that was any more homophobic or toxic or culturally so hateful. Yeah. Um, you know, they removed homosexuality from the Diagnostic Manual of Mental Disorders mm -hmm. in 1971. Right. I mean, that was right as he was, you know, just a little bit, what would that have been? He would have been, he's, he said he was 70? He's 69, yeah. 69, yeah. Um, so that was, he was already approaching adolescence. Mm -hmm. I'm quickly doing the math in my head correctly. Mm -hmm. And to be raised in an environment as a prepubescent teen that says, if I feel this way, I'm mentally disordered and I will be locked up in a psych ward. Yeah. And to, to be courageous enough to come out even though people might feel that way about you. I think mm -hmm. just leaves such a massive footprint on how much courage we need, how brave we need to be. But also, I didn't hear it from him necessarily. Um, so I don't want people to think that I'm, I, I'm talking about him behind his back. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, when I do work with older men um, who, are, who are gay older men, um, their sexuality presents very differently. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot more open. It's a lot more expressive. Um, and they, they talk about it in different ways, which almost feels like they learned about sexuality in a time when they couldn't talk about it very much. Absolutely. And it's, it's very different now than when a, you know, a 18 year old who has all the resources from institutions, yeah. um, like an affirming church that is teaching um, sexuality for queer kids. Yeah. And to hear the way that they're talking about sexuality and love is, is um, very different yes. than those of us who didn't have that, because I didn't have that either. That's right. Yeah, I think you're speaking, again, to something that we have to consistently remember and honor in a generational mindset is that there was a lot of fights that needed to be fought uh, during that time. And especially in the LGBTQ world, there really wasn't even like a um, feeling that that could be a world that was like shown. It was very much, we had to band together, right? Um, in order to stay strong. And if you tried to, um, you know, kind of, 
you had you had to be very um, outspoken, otherwise you were going to be shut down. And I think that ha that definitely influenced um, expressiveness, and I would imagine um, was very difficult to to mm -hmm. navigate. Right, this feeling of I just want what everybody else wants, which mm -hmm. is I want to you know be loved. I want to love somebody. I want to express my sexuality in the way that feels congruent and aligned with me. Um, but if I do that quietly, then we're not going to make any progress mm -hmm. um, as a community. And it's just going to continually be shamed. It's going to continually be oppressed. So we have a lot to, to be grateful for mm -hmm. um, from that generation. And um, seriously, I need to keep remembering, right? Is that mm -hmm. there are still there's still ground that needs to be covered. Obviously, living in more metropolitan cities, we have a lot of privilege, and mm -hmm. we're in the queer community because there's a lot more progress. But I think there's just a reminder there mm -hmm. around, um, you know, the differences of how things needed to be expressed because there was a lot more oppression. Right. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. And I think that oppression really, <clears throat> this is another thing that I picked up on, but that, that oppression really, um, I think, played a big influence on the ability to create relational intimacy mm -hmm. for that generation, you know, to be an out couple and walking around holding hands and having friends that could come over and support you to have serious allies from the straight community so that you can feel um, validated, not that we need the validation, but to feel, feel normal, whatever that is, to say, I am uh, living my life out, which is very different than being in love and still closeted. Mm -hmm. And I think as we negotiate relational intimacy, an out version of relational intimacy, it really, can um, bring a lot of, for a lot of people, a lot of ambivalence. Mm -hmm. I want this emotional intimacy, but I also am deadly afraid of having it because how do I hide it? How do I, will mm -hmm. I be caught for it? The other thing too that, that I like to talk about, and I think we talked about this um, in a former episode, um, we talked a lot about the role of enmeshment and, you know, for someone like our previous guest to be so concerned with at different parts of their life, staying closeted and staying stealth, if you will, to say no one can find out who I am, which means I'm keeping everybody happy by hiding who I am. And that is a version that we we take that as part of relational intimacy. So we say, if I'm doing relational intimacy, I have to hide who I am, at least parts. Then we're kind of that ambivalent part says, I really want it, but I don't, I don't want it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of queer people, because of that early on enmeshment with closeted lives, mm -hmm. we're often ambivalent in relationship. I really want this but I don't want to hide who I am or I really want this, but I'm tired of keeping people happy by performing for them. Exactly. And so I think that that, um, that ambivalence is definitely really present no matter what generation you are. I think it's Absolutely. not commensurated with what generation you're from, but more about how you lived in the closet and how much you needed that closet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, is, it's a process in a lot of ways of kind of reconciling this internal sense of betrayal if you actually achieve like the alignment that you're longing for. Because there's that sense of you have to figure out how to be outward facing, right, at some point in your life. Because there's still this navigating of I am different, but how do I... Um, express that how do I um stand you know in that difference especially when you're really young for example um and I think that that is a very much very much an aligning factor and something that I really appreciate about where Tim is at right now is I just see him really choosing to fight for that alignment mm -hmm. and even to the point 
of having to really reconcile potentially losing this relationship that means so much to him right now because it doesn't feel aligned with what he really wants, which is to have that intimacy in, in a partnership, to have that um, security. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting contrast because his partner that he's, that he's kind of working on this with um, kind of daily is in a place where I think, you know, the idea of more boxes or more um, kind of line, like kind of um, lines in the sand is like mm -hmm. probably terrifying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's a, it's, it's a process of trying to kind of figure out how do I be free, right? And so mm -hmm. to commit to one person is a big step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And may also not align with their, you know, experience of, of how they want relational intimacy either. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah, I think that negotiation of what is my definition of relational intimacy versus the definition of my partner. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to hold, I think, a whole host of subconscious mechanisms informing the definition. You know, let's say I was really enmeshed with, but my partner had no enmeshment. But maybe I wasn't shamed, but maybe my partner was. Yes. And so I might be really ambivalent to relational intimacy, but really open sexually. Mm -hmm. And he might want a lot of deep emotional connectedness without sexual activity. Right. And we might not know what mechanisms are kind of in that subconscious layer that help us determine, I want to be in a monogamous relationship versus polyamorous. And, and there's, of course, this conversation gets way more complex and there's way more things to consider because some of it can be beautiful. Yeah. Um, but I do think that it's really important to really understand what it is that we're craving. I like to think of attachments here. Yeah. And those four S's mm -hmm. is one way to think about it. The five domains of intimacy is another way of thinking about it. But the four S's say, am I safe with you? Mm -hmm. Can we create a nest and negotiate the boundaries well enough? Am I secure with you? Am I rooted and cemented in your heart and mind and in your life? Will you soothe me? Will you join me in my pain, but also in my joy? Yeah. And then see, will you see me and mm -hmm. see what it is that I want? And can those four pieces come together like a weaving basket yeah. to really hold us? And sometimes when we're still negotiating how to be seen or how to be safe or what it means, how deep do I want the security to go exactly. in this definition of relational intimacy, couples can get really off kilter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in this three-legged race, they start to fumble and fall because they're not on the same page. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, it's a process in a lot of ways of, um, I think we kind of had talked about that in the episode with Tim, about um, this process of respecting the individual has increased so much because we want so badly for everybody to be able to uh, figure out uh, exactly what it is that they need and I think that that's a wonderful thing and it's kind of a response in a lot of ways toward um, you know creating more validation to to really discover those things and not fit into a specific box but then at the same time I think relationships can suffer because there's then at times a neglect of that um, ability to form a we or a partnership and like you said that part the three-legged race right where you're joined together, a Venn diagram where there's an overlap, um, at times can be challenging because there's this feeling of, I want to be um, influenced by you and I want to influence you, but I also don't want to because I want you to be fully yourself. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes it's that piece of how do we navigate allowing ourselves to, um, to be differentiated but very much connected and how do we find that kind of overlap where we're still ourselves but we're also mm -hmm. competing something i always think about that from a lens of like um science where it's like 
you know, if you have like hydrogen and you have oxygen, like both of those things like really are very important in the stability of the world and like everything else. Mm -hmm. But if both of those actually give up just a little bit of their independence to come together, they form water. And um, it's something that we have to think about too, of like what are we willing to kind of give to then healthily get, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where, where Tim has arrived and I commend him for that because he's becoming more and more aware over the years and he's now living out of this place I really appreciate it when he said I want those three things he's like I want to find passion I want to find intimacy and I want to find commitment Mm -hmm. um, with a relationship in this Mm -hmm. part of my life and Mm -hmm. that's really brave yeah he's just a lump of bravery I mean yeah. through everything that he's you know had to do to be authentic and honest with himself yes exactly and what he's done i know for the gay men's chorus um he has not only had to figure out how to be brave and how to face himself and how to deal with all these different parts but i know that he's really stood the gap for a lot of people And he's really played a very important role um, in his life for other people in the community to feel supported and to step into that same freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, just so it's here, I mentioned the five domains of intimacy, and this is a um, Terry Real thing. It comes from the um, the New Rules of Marriage, which is his book, but they're social. these are five domains of intimacy, social. Do we get along in the community? Do we have similar interests? Do we like spending time with each other and each other's friends? Obviously the sexual intimacy and are we respectful? For some people that spiritual intimacy, which can oftentimes be synonymous with passion, yeah. um, but intellectual intimacy, you know, do we spend three hours having pillow talk, just chit chatting about the cosmos and the, the <laughs> mysteries of life and then obviously that emotional intimacy um, which houses the four s's um, so I always like to throw that out there so people can kind of understand um, or kind of keep a gauge on there as you know if those five domains of intimacy if each one had a gauge on the dashboard of the relationship they could look at which one needs more fuel which one's dipping which one needs a new fan belt which one needs new spark plugs and they can kind of keep the relationship kind of functioning the way that they want Absolutely. I think for me, one other thing that um, is really important, especially now, as we're kind of living a very different life with COVID-19 being present, Mm -hmm. someone once said, and I really resonated with it, but that COVID is a thief. Mm. And it's stealing a lot from us, which is forcing us to grieve. You know, we're losing a lot in that loss. And one thing that Tim brought up was this tragic death of his daughter mm-hmm. you know and I just kind of want to be really gentle here with the people who are listening to say that mm-hmm. grief might be really present for you right now the, the loss of your independence the loss of being able to spend time with your friends the loss of travel the loss of seeing your coworkers and going to work mm-hmm. just the loss of so many things that kept us stable And, um, you know, whether we're losing someone deeply important to us, like a daughter Mm -hmm. or a a facet of life, I think realizing that grief is something we cannot control, maybe that we can facilitate might be really helpful for a lot of people right now. I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's really well spoken. And also to kind of, um see grief as a as an opening to invitation right for there to be um a ceiling and kind of a healing of what was and then an invitation into what will be and that even though we don't like grieving um it does have a way of partnering with us and if we walk slowly with it um transforms us too um, Mm -hmm. and can and can really bring out um, something beautiful. And so it's not minimizing the really hard and raw and painful places, 
um, that that grief touches and exposes. Um, but it's realizing it's doing that so that way joy, I think, can also be more attainable. Mm-hmm. And so hopefully, you know, that that creates um, just a sense of anchoring and comfort that mm-hmm. it's not going to be this hard for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite roads, um, quotes, excuse me, comes from Richard Rohr. It's a very simple one, but he would say death before life. Mm-hmm. And in that paradox, just exactly kind of what you're saying here, but to grieve the death that has happened so that we can be really present in the life that is, Mm -hmm. I think is so, it's just, it's transformative, you know. I'm sure a lot of people know about, um, I call them very similar, the five domains of grief, Mm -hmm. the depression, the bargaining, denial, acceptance, and the anger which I think happens more like popcorn than stages. You know, we don't go from anger to depression. We go from anger to bargaining to depression, back to anger to bargaining to depression to some acceptance, then back to anger, depression, bargaining, and denial. And it's almost like we're kind of (laughs) swiveling through this um, spiral that gets a lot more big and a lot less intense as we slide down into it. Mm -hmm. So the bargaining is less intense and we hit it less often. The depression is less intense and we hit it less often. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2017, I lost someone who was incredibly important to me and it was um, somewhat expected, but also just really tragic for me. And mm. I picked up a book to kind of help me go through the grieving process and the five domains were helpful and to fill this popcorn experience kind of happening in my body. Mm-hmm. But I had never heard of this before, but there were these three P's that come with death as well. And one of them is pervasive. Mm. This grief is going to consume my whole life Mm -hmm. and it's going to overwhelm me. Um, Permanence, I'm going to feel this way forever. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to carry this with me. And then this really painful one, the personalization. This was my fault. It could have somehow helped. You know, if I would have known about that medical disorder, she could, I could have done this and this, and I could have found a specialist here. Mm -hmm. And with her heart attacks, I could have taught her how to cook this, this, and this, and I could have kept her alive at least for one more month or one more year or one Mm -hmm. more decade. And I think as we're grieving, it's not only important to let ourselves go through that popcorn experience, but also to really challenge the narratives that say this is going to be here forever. Or, you know, I hear people saying, life is never going to be the same. (laughs) And that may be true in some systemic ways. We might always be in restaurants a little differently. Or if we're sick, we might carry a mask in our back pocket. And some things might change. But also, let's be aware of the permanence. Let's be aware of the pervasiveness of of the grief that we're all in, kind of collectively as a human race. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's, it's... not going to be this way forever we're going to find a new normal um i just think death is such a big part of our reality that we don't we don't talk about and oftentimes i think we're grieving when we don't even realize it Mm -hmm. it'd be important just to kind of call that out a little i agree yeah and it's helpful to anchor to something that this experience that you know our listeners might be having actually you know is a connective experience it's a human experience and that helps to reduce some of the isolation that they might be feeling right now too Mm -hmm. Um, to realize that um, as humans we all go through these things grief visits all of us um, in different ways in different seasons and um, it's more how we walk with it and how we welcome it and what comes from it you know Mm -hmm. that might be um, kind of different but Mm -hmm. there's opportunity there for sure Mm -hmm. and um i think when you were talking the thing that really kind of struck me too is that idea and kind of the 12-step tenet of you gain control by giving up control Mm -hmm. and um to some extent that's you know i think what grief prompts us to do Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i know this is kind of throwing you on the spot but real quickly as we wrap up this Um, episode with Tim if there was a part of his personality that you would like to engender what would it be oh oh my gosh if 
there was a part of his personality that I would like to engender. I'll start. Maybe it'll prompt me. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is his courage to confront life. Um, mm. To, again, to, to identify, to, to be married to a woman mm. and to, to find so much joy in having children. And maybe, I don't know if, if it was a joyful marriage, but then to say, mm. I need to confront the fear that life is bringing me and I need to come out. And then to enter into polyamory and really just kind of see so much beauty in it. But then to say, mm -hmm. I'm also wanting this deep security. And I think there's this like um, the, the four scaredy cat, emotional, anxious part of me that's like, I just want to be safe. So don't make me confront challenging things in life. <laughs> don't make me need to like have courage to overcome that. Um, <laughs> so I just found that really, really inspiring to, to not take life so seriously yeah. and to not need to be perfect throughout life and to say like how about life is more of a I know we talk about this but like a journey of mistakes and bruises and and I can heal and I don't need to be so serious with it so I think so Tim wherever you are if you're listening thank you for teaching me a little bit about how to be courageous and bold to really create the life that I want. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, it, it would be um, the resiliency of humor. When mm. we first talked to Tim, uh, just to kind of, you know, get a sense of what the podcast would be like and everything else, that just really struck me about um, who he is and his story. Because there's this type of humor that happens when people are avoiding their pain or when they're avoiding a situation or kind of like trying to deflect. And then there's a humor that comes from like kind of this deep uh, having lived life, uh, a kind of compassionate, a sort of self-knowing in terms of, you know, these are my strengths, but also these are my flaws. And that humor um, really is resilient and it feels that way. When, uh, when Tim was making jokes, um, I was just struck by that where I felt like, oh, wow, like this is, you know, someone who's really um, had to figure out a lot of these things and has learned how to find like the sweet humor in it mm -hmm. to kind of um, anchor himself. And then, um, you know, really kind of, again, express to some degree some of the joy, right, of the absurdity, right, of certain things in life. And so um, that was just something I think that really struck me among many other things um, about his personality. And I just found it to be very invitational, like, okay, I could be myself with him. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's such a healing thing to be in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Queer Relationships is a podcast sponsored by I Am Clinic a counseling practice devoted to the LGBTQ plus community with in-person and virtual counseling options available. I am Clinic. Create the love lives and relationships you crave. Find us online on Instagram at LGBTQ underscore therapy and Facebook at I am Clinic. That's I-A-M Clinic. <laughs>